So that's uh, really something you shouldn't use. Uh, but there's another one that is uh, sometimes not considered, and that's the, the block size, if, when you have a block cipher. And in particular, if you look at uh, Blowfish and Triple Death, they have a block size of only 64 bits. And it turns out that uh, this is uh, insufficient. That's really the, the point of this talk. I'm going to talk about block ciphers with a small block size. I'm going to show that you shouldn't use triple death on Blowfish because their block size is too small. So even though they have a big uh, key size, they're actually worse than AS128. And I'm actually going to show practical attacks. So they're really uh, not that good in a, in a very strong sense. So first, uh, a bit of definition. So I'm going to talk about block ciphers. So a block cipher. Uh, takes an input of a fixed size, takes a key, and gives you a ciphertext of fixed size. I'm going to use n as a block size, so uh, I'm not talking about uh, format preserving encryption here, so the size is fixed. And when you want to actually use it, of course, if the size is fixed, but you want to encrypt messages of variable length, so what you usually do is use a mode of operation. And the mode of operation is a way to call your block cipher several times in order to deal with uh, variable length messages. And uh, the main mode I'm going to talk about, well, basically the only one is CBC, and CBC looks like this. And what you do is you start from some uh, initialization value here, which uh, should be random. And then you XOR this with your first message block. You encrypt it. This is your first ciphertext block. And then you XOR the previous ciphertext block with the next message block. You encrypt this, and that's how you get uh, the next one. And you iterate this construction. And this construction is, uh, is really used a lot in practice, and uh, it has a uh, good uh, security. It has a good security, but it's still not as secure as the block cipher you're using, and that's uh, a more general problem, that when you use a mode of operation, usually you don't get the same security as the block cipher you start from. And in the case of CBC, there's a very simple collision attack. And what happens is if you just look at your uh, ciphertext, so you assume you have some long ciphertext, and you look at all the ciphertext blocks, and you try to find out if there are, there are collisions between those ciphertext blocks. But at some point, this will happen. So you will have two ciphertext blocks which are equal. And when this happens, you know that the plain text that was encrypted must also be equal, because the, uh, the block cipher is a permutation. So if the output is the same, then the input is also the same. And when you try to figure out what is this input, it's the XOR of a message block and a ciphertext block. Of course, the ciphertext is known. And so what you get is every time you see a collision, you learn the XOR of two plain text block. So here you're going to learn the XOR of M2 and M5. So this is what happens with CBC. Every time you have a collision, you learn the XOR of two uh, plain text block. So the next question is, how long does it take to get collisions? And it's actually pretty fast to get collision because of something we call the birthday paradox. If you, are, uh, if you have n bit blocks and you pick them randomly, you expect to find a collision after about 2 to the n over 2 uh, blocks. And this is because being a collision is a property of pairs of blocks. It's not just a collision of a property of one block, it's a property of a pair of blocks. If, if you have 2 to the n over 2 blocks, you actually have 2 to the n pairs of blocks. So there's a good chance that one of those pairs uh, will be a collision. So it means uh, the collision attack against CBC only requires 2 to the n over 2 uh, blocks. So you have an attack with complexity basically 2 to the n over 2, while if you look at the security of a block cipher, what you expect is uh, you shouldn't have attack with less than 2 to the n uh, calls to a block cipher. So you really have uh, a drop in security because of modes of operations. So uh, more generally, the way we study modes of operation usually if with, is uh, with provable security. So what you try to do is to prove that the mode of operation is secure, assuming that the block cipher is secure. And you usually have statements like this, showing that an attack against CBC uh, will succeed with probability bounded by the probability to attack the block cipher plus uh, some term uh, sigma square over 2 to the n. And this is basically the same for all uh, modes of operation that are actually used. So the interesting thing is actually this term here, this sigma square over 2 to the n. So here, sigma is the number of blocks that you're encrypting. And what you can see is if sigma is close to 2 v to the n over 2, then this term here is close to 1, and then the proof basically doesn't say anything. The, the success rate is smaller than 1. That's not uh, an interesting statement. So what we need to, to get security of a mode of operation is uh, the number of encrypted blocks must be, must be much smaller than 2 to the n over 2, so that the success rate of an adversary stays small. And if you look at the 64-bit block cipher, it turns out this bound is only 32 gigabytes, so that's not very high. So uh, 
But that's really the problem with 64-bit uh, block ciphers. So all of this is uh, well known, uh, at least by cryptographers. And if you look at the way cryptographers talk about this problem, uh, for instance, uh, this is a statement by Roger Ray in 2011. So the problem was known uh, way, way before that. But this statement is uh, well, uh, a nice way to present it. So Roger Ray says, attacks can be a serious concern when employing a block cipher of n equals 64 bits, requiring relatively frequent rekeying to keep sigma smaller than 2 to the 32. So the idea is, uh, if you want to encrypt more data, you should change your key from time to time so that you don't encrypt too much data with the same key. So that's the way we usually see it uh, from the more theoretical point of view. Now, if you look at uh, the way this is presented uh, more closer to practice, there's, for instance, a, a document by ISO that talks about this. And in this document, they say, uh, if you have a block cipher with uh, n-bit block size, you must rekey before 2 to the n-bit blocks. And if you do this, as long as the implementation of a specific block cipher do not exceed these limits, using the block cipher will be safe. So that's what ISO says. And this is completely wrong, because if you stop just before 2 to the n over 2 blocks, there is already a very high probability to have a collision, uh, something around 60% probability to have a collision. So you already lose everything. So that's uh, from uh, standard bodies. And now if you look at actual implementations, it gets even worse. In practice, most implementations don't do any rekeying at all, and they will happily encrypt all the data you give them. So, so there is really a problem, uh, probably a communication problem, between uh, theoretical cryptography and more uh, practice-oriented, uh, well, the, the practice side. And, <clears throat> okay. So uh, now the question is, uh, how, how much is this really practical? So that, that's really the main uh, point of this talk. I'm going to show how to turn this well-known collision attack into a real practical problem uh, against real uh, protocols. So yeah, the main question is, how bad is it really in practice? Because so far, what I said is you just get the XOR of a few plain text blocks, so it doesn't look that bad to just leak a few XORs. And, uh, well, maybe in practice it's hard to get really that amount of data encrypted. So that's really the, the kind of question we're going to look at. So the first thing is 64-bit uh, block ciphers are actually used in a lot of protocols. For instance, in OpenVPN, in TLS, in 3G telephony, uh, all those uh, use 64-bit uh, block ciphers. In fact, uh, basically all the protocols that were designed before the AS was standardized, well, there were not... Well, the, the main block ciphers available at the time were 64-bit block ciphers, so that's what is used in, the, in those protocols. So, for instance, uh, if you look at TLS, SSH, uh, IKE, all the early versions uh, have only 64-bit uh, block ciphers available, and then later instantiation added uh, AES mostly. And in many cases, it was, it's, uh, it was actually mandatory to implement some of those 64-bit block ciphers, well, which makes sense. And you can also see that a lot of them don't uh, impose, don't ask you to rekey before some limit. A few standards ask you to rekey, but usually the bound is pretty high. So for instance, in SSH2, uh, the bound is 2 to the 32, to, sorry, 2 to the 30, so you already have a high probability to have collision. And same thing in, with a one gigabyte bound, you still have, an, well, it's a bit lower, but it's still a non-negligible probability to see collisions. And uh, yeah, in fact, it seems that the, 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 the consensus is that those attacks are not really practical. And in fact, if you look at uh, what OpenSSL does, so OpenSSL has uh, a list of ciphers called HIVE, which are supposed to provide high security. And this list, uh, if you look at, well, before 2014, this list was actually ordered by key size. So this again makes the point, well, the, 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 easiest, uh, uh, the easiest criterion to look at is the key size. And when you look at the key size, you have the impression that triple dash is better than AES-128, and that what was done at the time in OpenSSL. They fixed it uh, in 2014, so they put triple dash at the end of this list, but they still consider it high security. So really the point is, uh, <coughs> practical people don't see this as, as a real issue. And what I'm going to show it is really an issue. Um, yeah, so um, in order to really get a practical attack, we're going to look at a, a specific uh, scenario. And the scenario we look at is we consider a fixed messages that is encrypted uh, many, many times under the same key. So that will make uh, the attacks uh, a lot easier. And we assume that this fixed message uh, includes inside the message there's something of high value, something that uh, as an adversary we are very interested in. So maybe there's a password that, that is part of the message or maybe there's some authentication cookie or something like that. And that's what we're going to try to recover. <coughs> 
I'd also assume that the rest of the message is mostly known because maybe there are some headers that are predictable, which is usually the case, or uh, maybe you can even choose some of it. But yeah, we assume that most of the message is known and a little bit is unknown and uh, actually of high value. And now what we do is we encrypt this fixed, fixed, fixed message many, many times. And at some point we start to have collisions and uh, we hope that eventually one of the collision will give us uh, the cookie. So we have a little picture to show what it looks like. So we assume we have some uh, fixed plain text message. So in this case, that's just an HTTP request. So get index.html, HTTP 1.1, and uh, cookie C equals something. So all the green part is supposed to be known by the adversary, and the red part is the secret that we're trying to recover. And now we get, we're getting encryption of this fixed message, so one by one. But at some point, uh, we start to have collisions between the ciphertext blocks. So, uh, for instance, here we have one collision. So when we see this collision, we can find out the XOR between the corresponding uh, plain text blocks. So that's good. Well, in this case, both plain text blocks are already known, so we don't learn anything when we get this XOR. We already knew it. But, well, at least we can check that everything is happening as expected. So we keep asking for more encryption, more and more. We're going to get more collisions, uh, one more, but those collisions are still not interesting because the corresponding message blocks uh, are already known, but we keep running the attack, and at some point we will get a collision between uh, the blocks corresponding to the cookie and the block that is known, and then we can just recover the cookie because we know the XOR and we know one of the blocks, so we just compute the value of the other block. So that's basically how the attack works. It's quite simple. You have this fixed message encrypted a lot of time, and you look for collisions. So um, if you want to evaluate the success, pro the, the complexity of this attack, basically, uh, if the message size is 2 to the t blocks, you're going to need about 2 to the t collisions uh, before one of them is interesting for you, before you actually get uh, the cookie value. So up to small factors, of course, but something close to 2 to the t. And if you look at the corresponding number of blocks, it will take about 2 to the n over 2 plus t over 2 blocks to get this number of collisions. And in terms of uh, copies of the message, this uh, turns out to be 2 to the n over 2 minus uh, t over 2. And you can see it's actually possible to do some trade-offs between the number of copies and the total amount of data. If you can make the messages somewhat bigger, what happens is the total comp com data complexity increases, but the number of copies of the message decreases. So you need, if you have a bigger message, you need less copies of the message, but the total complexity is higher. So in some cases, it can be interesting to play uh, with this trade-off. It depends really uh, what, what kind of complexity you look at, what is your, your complexity measure. Um, another uh, thing uh, we can look at is what happens if there is rekeying. So if we assume, for instance, that the key changes just before reaching 2 to the n over 2 blocks, uh, maybe we're following the ISO recommendation, so in this case, uh, the attack will uh, still mostly succeed. It's just that every time you have a new key, you get all the ciphertext with this key, and you look for collision in this. Sometimes you get no collision. Sometimes you get uh, one collision. Uh, maybe rarely you get two. But in the end, you, you just uh, keep encrypting with different keys, and with each different key, you might get one or zero collision. And in the end, if you have enough collision, it will still work. So the complexity goes up a little bit, but uh, depending on the parameters, it, uh, it will still be uh, close to practical. Okay, so that's the main idea of the attack. Now we have to look at the specific uh, context to apply it. And uh, we looked at uh, HTTP because that's a very uh, important protocol. And there's something uh, quite interesting in HTTP. It's a stateless protocol, which means when you want to load a website, if you have to make several queries, maybe you, you load the uh, HTML page, you load the CSS file, you load some images, and so on and so on. And each of those requests at the HTTP level, they're completely independent. You don't have a notion of session. So if you need authentication in HTTP, the authentication token has to be sent with every request. So that's very nice for us because now we, we will exactly have this scenario where we can encrypt a fixed message and every time there will be this high value secret inside uh, the fixed message. And there are two kinds of secrets uh, we considered. Uh, the main one is probably cookies. That's uh, the, the most commonly used authentication mechanism on the web. And another one is HTTP basic auth, which just allows you to put your username and password in a special uh, HTTP header. But the details don't really matter, as long as you have one fixed value in your uh, message that you want to recover. And the nice thing is, if you can recover uh, the cookie, then if you send 
new HTTP queries with the correct cookie, you will get the data that was supposed to be for the legitimate user. Even if you come from a different IP address, most of the time you will get the data because that's really the only way to keep sessions in HTTP, it's this cookie. So if you get it, uh, the server will consider you a part of the same session as uh, the rest of the data. Another nice feature is uh, this authentication information is sent even in uh, cross-origin requests. And one reason for this is to allow something like the, the Facebook button. If you want to integrate elements in a web page that come from a different domain, to make this work, you need to send the authentication token even if you make requests to different domains. And that's very nice for the attacker, of course. So the, the scenario we use is uh, the same as the beast uh, scenario. So we assume the attacker sits uh, somewhere on the network, so he has access to the network. Uh, the most likely scenario is an open Wi-Fi hotspot. So you can just see the packets coming in the air, and maybe you can also modify them if you need to. And we assume that the user is logged in to some secure website, maybe a webmail, and so uh, there is a cookie set in his navigator that allows him to authenticate to the webmail. And what the attacker does is uh, first he has to trick the victim to visit a malicious web page, and this web page will have some JavaScript code in it, and the JavaScript code will make requests to uh, the webmail, basically, and every request will include the secret cookie. So we will make a lot of requests from this JavaScript code, and each of them will include uh, the authentication token. And the attacker, of course, can see the encrypted data, and that's how he will uh, look for collisions and eventually recover the secret value. So um, the first scenario we look at is uh, not HTTPS with TLS, but a slightly easier scenario to attack. It's HTTP over uh, OpenVPN. And OpenVPN is a solution to build a virtual private network. And what you do is, uh, basically, if you want to access some secure network, maybe at your university or company, and uh, so you just set up a tunnel between your machine and one machine in the secure network, and then all communication will be encrypted in the tunnel and will be in plain text uh, on the other side. And OpenVPN is a popular solution to do that. And it turns out that uh, the default configuration using Blowfish, which is a 64-bit block cipher, so it's going to be uh, vulnerable to this attack, and they use it in CBC mode. So that's the ideal scenario for this attack. And there are two different uh, modes for OpenVPN. One of them uses uh, a pre-shared key. So you have to set up yourself the keys on both sides of the connection. But in this case, the key is used directly to encrypt packets. There is never any rekeying. So that's, again, completely ideal for us. And the second mode is called a TLS mode. And in this case, you use a TLS handshake to set up encryption keys uh, for the tunnel. And usually, this is done with certificates. So when you use this TLS mode, it's possible to do rekeying, because you can just do another TLS handshake to get uh, new keys. And by default, uh, the limit is uh, to rekey every hour and with a hard limit add to the 32 packets. So this will make the attack a bit harder, but one hour is still uh, a long time, so you can send close to, to the 32 packets in one hour. So uh, the attack would still be doable in this setting. But for the demonstration, of course, we use uh, this one, which is uh, much easier to attack. So in practice, uh, we did this between a Firefox client and an Nginx uh, server connected with OpenVPN in pre-shared key modes. So everything nice and easy. Uh, it turns out uh, each HTTP request will be encrypted in a different OpenVPN packet, so it's very easy to extract the ciphertext. There's always a fixed size header in the OpenVPN packet and then the ciphertext blocks. So we know exactly which ciphertext blocks correspond to which plain text block. So this part is really easy. So now uh, what we have to do is just write some JavaScript that fires up a lot of queries to the server. It turns out in practice we use uh, request, well, we, we pad a little bit the request to make them bigger because there's uh, this trade-off between the message size and the number of messages you have to send. And making that a little bit bigger allows the attack to be a little bit faster at the cost of more data, but in terms of time, it makes the attack faster. And in this setting, we get about uh, 3,000 requests per second, so that's uh, a, decent, uh, a decent rate. So uh, the rest of the setup will just capture the data with TCP dump, remove the header, extract the ciphertext blocks, then you just, uh, you just take all your ciphertext block, you sort this, and you look for collisions after sorting. And uh, when you do the math, it turns out you need about, in this setting, you need about seven or 800 gigabytes of data, so that's a big amount, but not an incredibly big amount. That's something you can do in practice. And you expect that it takes about 19 hours to capture all this data, and uh, in, uh, in our practical run, it took, well, 
basically exactly what we predicted. So it really works as expected, and we get the secret cookie at the end. So that's the first uh, proof of concept implementation. So the next step is to look at TLS, because that's a more uh, popular choice for encryption. So now I'm going to see how we can apply this attack to HTTP in the context of TLS, so HTTPS. Uh, something important in uh, TLS is that there is a negotiation for the, the cipher suit that will be used. So what happens is when a browser connects to an HTTPS server, the browser says, okay, uh, hello, this is me. I, I can use this and this encryption algorithm. So maybe I can use uh, triple DES, I can use AES, I can use RC4. And this list is uh, ordered, so it will be more like RC4 or maybe triple DES or maybe RC, uh, sorry, AES or maybe triple DES or maybe RC4. And then the server chooses which one it wants to use out of this list sent by the client. And then uh, there's some key exchange to derive a secret key, and this secret key is used to encrypt all the data after that. And uh, of course, triple DES is one of the ciphers you can select. It's actually mandatory to implement up to TLS 1.1, so it's implemented in most uh, TLS implementations. So the question uh, we have to solve now is, well, first, how much is it used? Well, I'm saying it's implemented, but is it really used? And uh, next, can we really have very long sessions uh, encrypting uh, 700 gigabytes in the same uh, TLS session? That's what I'm going to look at now. So the first one, uh, how much is TLS used? Well, we did several measurements, and we think it's used for about one or two percent of HTTPS connections. So the, there are mostly two reasons why a connection would be encrypted with triple DES. The first one is if you have a, a very old client or server that doesn't support AES, then, well, in this case, triple DES is, well, probably best than nothing. And the second case, which uh, is probably bigger than the first one, is just poorly configured servers. There are many servers that support AES but actually prefer triple DES. So that's a little bit surprising, but we saw a lot of this. So uh, one first way to estimate this uh, percentage is to do a scan of uh, the top one million website from Alexa. And this is what we did. And when we did this scan in February, we saw that basically 90% uh, of the servers supported triple DES. So this is ranked uh, according to the top uh, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and 1 million. And it's basically the same for all, all blocks. And triple DES would be actually used for one and a half or maybe 2% of, uh, of those servers. I did this again uh, last month, and it seemed to have dropped a little bit, so that's a good thing. Uh, maybe some people have reacted to, to this attack. Uh, oh yeah, I'm going to show you a few examples of websites that use triple DES, so this is uh, interesting. So this is the eBay uh, login page, and uh, so it's no longer the case. They fixed it a few weeks ago. But if you've been to this web page, uh, say, uh, last summer, you look, so this is just, uh, I just run Firefox, go to this web page, and look at the properties of the connection. And uh, yeah, it's using triple DES. Nice. So there are actually high profile websites that use triple DES. Here is another example. This is uh, match.com, so an important uh, online uh, dating website. And same thing, you go to the logging page, look at the properties of the connection, it's using triple DES again. If you dig a little bit, a little bit uh, deeper, here is a list of the cipher text they, of the uh, cipher suite they support. They support triple DES and AES, but they prefer triple DES. So uh, if your client supports triple DES, you're going to use triple DES, even if you also support AES. Uh, a last one, uh, maybe a more funny one, the webmail of the Trump Organization. Uh, this was in the news a few days ago. The server uh, runs an old version of IIS, and it turns out this doesn't support AES. So you get, yeah, RC4, triple DES, and then a bunch of crap, like DES, uh, export ciphers, for some, uh, yeah, really bad things. <laughs> uh, finally, another way to estimate this uh, usage of uh, triple DES is to look at telemetry data from Firefox. And this is a timeline of telemetry data. You can see uh, until early 2015, there was a lot of RC4, and then this went down to zero because uh, RC4 support was removed from Firefox. But when you remove RC4 support, it turns out triple DES goes up because uh, some server now switched to uh, triple DES instead of RC4. Okay, so uh, that was about usage of triple DES. Now the next question is, can we have very long sessions? And it turns out, uh, Basically, we can, and uh, in more detail, uh, web browser uh, will keep a connection open as long as they can. 
Web servers, it's a little bit more nuanced. Uh, Apache and Nginx, by default, they have a limit of 200 queries per session, so the attack is not going to work. IIS doesn't seem to have this kind of limit. And in practice, if you look at various high-profile websites, about half of them will allow a uh, very long connection. So in many cases, it will work. And we have found uh, a lot of vulnerable web websites that satisfy both conditions. They use triple desk with modern browser, and they support uh, very long sessions. So again, we can do a proof of concept demo. Uh, it's basically the same code as the open, uh, open VPN attack. In practice, basically nothing changes. We use the same JavaScript code. We still capture packets. We extract the ciphertext. Now it's just a slightly different position because the headers are not the same. But it's uh, basically the same. Uh, there are two differences. The first one is it's a little bit slower because uh, I guess uh, Firefox is a bit slower to encrypt than OpenVPN because it's all in the same process, maybe. And the second difference is to make it more uh, efficient, what we do is, well, uh, if you look at how Firefox connects to a TLS server, it opens several connections in parallel to improve the throughput. And that's bad for us because those connections will use different keys, of course. So what we do is we kill several of them to keep a single one active, and then all the data uses uh, the same key. But that's just an optimization. You don't really have to do this. Okay. Um, so. This is about the attack. Now, what can you do about it? So the first thing, of course, is uh, switch to a better uh, block cipher, switch to AES, and then everything will be fine. So if you, run, uh, if you run an HTTPS server, you should look at your config and you should fix it if it's using triple dash right now. The second thing you can do is limit the connection length, and this is a little bit easier because it can be done either on the server or on the client. So it's probably uh, easier to deploy in practice. And the, uh, the last option that's probably more theoretical is to use a different mode of operation. So I said most of the modes we use today have some kind uh, of problem at this, this birthday bound of 2 to the n over 2 blocks, but there are special modes that, uh, that are more resistant to this, for instance, c -Ank. So you could switch to one of those modes, and maybe that's a good option for lightweight crypto, where you, maybe you want to use really uh, short block ciphers. But yeah, that's uh, something to look at. Another question, of course, is should we get rid of triple dash in TLS? Well, I don't really know. Um, of course, you should make sure it's only used as a last resort. So you should fix the configuration when it's used, but something better is available. And probably you should limit the section length to limit the impact of the attack. But even then, as long as you keep triple dash available, there could be problem if you have something like downgrade attacks. And there's been a lot of those against TLS in the last years. So maybe keeping triple dash live is a risk if for a future uh, uh, future downgrade attack. So as, a, as a, an almost example, uh, if you have triple desk allowed with TLS false start, then we can force you to use triple desk even though you wouldn't use it normally. So that's one of the scenarios that, that could be an issue. So we disclosed this attack uh, in last uh, August. So the website is uh, suite32.info and that's the name of uh, our attack. And we've had some very good response from vendors, so uh, OpenVPN now issues a warning when you use a small block cipher, and they're working on a better solution in the future, but the problem is that they don't have any cipher text negoti uh, cipher suite negotiation in OpenVPN. It's hard-coded in the client and server configuration, so you have to change both at the same time, so it's a bit tricky to, to change uh, the default. Uh, another good response from uh, Mozilla, they are working on data limits, and it will be in one of the next uh, versions of Firefox. OpenSSL has also moved, moved triple dash to the low category, so that's very good. It used to be in the high category. And uh, Microsoft has removed triple dash from the false start whitelist, so that's also good. Um, an interesting thing uh, to look at is to compare this with the recent attacks against RC4. And um, the attacks are very similar in terms of setting. We need uh, this beast setting where you encrypt a lot of time the same message. But there's a big difference in RC4. The ideal case is if you have a different key for each message. In our case, we need the same key for a lot of message. So that's a bit different. Apart from that, it's mostly the same. And so to conclude, uh, I would like to say birthday attacks uh, are uh, really practical against 64-bit block ciphers, so be careful uh, with them. And so that will be the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Time for one or two questions. Um, yeah, hello. This is Eric Bodden from Paderborn University. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so your main recommendation seems to be to use a larger block size, 128 bits. Yeah. So I wonder 
if that won't give us the same trouble, you know, a few years in the future when people um, will basically apply the same attack to larger block sizes. Um, and I was wondering at the same time whether another cipher block chaining mode wouldn't be actually a better way to go to think about other modes to, you know, instead of just XOR. Okay, so with, with block size of 128 bits like we have in AES, there is indeed a problem at around 2 to the 64 blocks. So it's much higher than uh, in this case, but yeah, it's still not that high. So maybe it's something we should also think about. I think it's about the amount of uh, storage that Google has. It's close to this 2 to the 64 block. So it's not something completely implausible. It's, it's still very, very big, but yeah, it, it will probably be an issue uh, sooner or later. And uh, the second solution to change uh, the modes is, yeah, it's absolutely uh, something possible. That's something I mentioned here. There are modes like CANC that uh, resist, uh, CANC resists up to 2 to the 2n over 3 rather than n over 2. So you get better security with those kinds of modes. As far as I know, they're not used in practice yet. But yeah, it's, uh, it's probably also a good thing to, to look more at those modes. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we don't want to miss the mayor's dinner, so <laughs> we have to take the rest. So thank you very much again.